Hello, my name is Kirk Weiler, and this is another Math for Honors Arlington High School lesson. Today we're going to be doing Unit 6, Lesson Number 6 on Other Trigonometric Functions. This is primarily a review lesson, because what we're going to be looking at today are the four other trig functions besides sine and cosine. These are always less important than sine and cosine, but still the expectation is that we'll know their definitions, we'll know how to manipulate them, evaluate them, graph them, and eventually we'll be able to, to do calculus with them. For now though, let's just remember what the other four functions are. All right, exercise number one says, see if you can recall how each of the following trigonometric functions is defined in terms of the sine function and the cosine function. Pause the video now if you need to and try to fill in those definitions. All right, let's take a look. Now, sine and cosine are always defined in terms of the unit circle, but the other four trig functions are all defined in terms of sine and cosine. So for example, the tangent function is defined as the sine function divided by the cosine function. Simple enough. The cotangent function is defined as the cosine divided by the sine. Sometimes it's helpful to know that that's 1 divided by the tangent function, but not necessarily. The secant function, this is one of the ones I actually have the most problems with because I often have to think about whether it's 1 divided by sine or 1 divided by cosine. And to me, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but secant is 1 divided by cosine. And cosecant is 1 divided by sine. One of the great ironies, in my own opinion, about all four of these functions is that not always, but almost every time we use one of them, we always revert back to these four definitions. So it's absolutely critical that you know immediately the definition of tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant in terms of sine and cosine. And of course, the first thing that we can do with that kind of information is simply evaluate the functions. Functions aren't very useful if we can't come up with their values. So let's take a look in exercise number two when we're going to figure out the value of tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant at a variety of different values. Let's do tangent of pi over 4 together, and then we'll have you do the other three on your own. So for instance, tangent of pi over 4, I would immediately say, well, I know tangent of any angle is the sine of that angle divided by the cosine of that angle. In this case, we're working with radians, but it really wouldn't matter. We know that the sine of pi over 4 is root 2 divided by 2. We know the cosine of pi over 4 is also root 2 divided by 2, and any non-zero quantity divided by itself is equal to 1. All right, that's a very important one, by the way. I would highly suggest knowing off the top of your head that the tangent of an angle, I'm sorry, the tangent of pi over 4 is equal to 1. One of the really amazing things about tangent, and let's kind of go back and look at it, because it is the third most important function. Let's look, go back and look at exercise 1a is that tangent really is just the y-coordinate on the unit circle divided by the x-coordinate. And if you will, what this really means is that the tangent is the slope, the slope of a line at a particular angle. So if you think about a line that is at an angle of pi over 4, it has a slope of 1. And that's kind of cool, because then if you say, well, all right, well, what's the tangent of 0? Well, that's going to have a slope of 0. On the other hand, if you ask, what's the tangent of pi over 2? That's going to have a slope that's undefined. All right, so what I'd like you to do now is pause the video and come up with the value of b, c, and d by using those definitions. Be careful, but pause the video now and take a shot. Okay. Let's go through them. Some of these are going to get a little bit messy. It is what it is. Cotangent of 2 pi over 3 is going to be the cosine of 2 pi divided by 3, all divided by the sine of 2 pi divided by 3. So we think to ourselves, what's the cosine of 2 pi divided by 3? 
and we come up with negative 1 half. What's the sine of 2 pi over divided by 3? <laughs> we get root 3 over 2. If we simplify this a bit, we get negative 1 divided by root 3. I think that's a completely okay way of leaving your final answer. If you don't like that radical in the denominator, you could of course rationalize it and get negative root 3 over 3, but it doesn't really matter. All right, let's keep going. In letter C, we're asked what the secant of 3 pi over 2 is. Well, the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine function, so that's 1 divided by the cosine of 3 pi divided by 2. We might have to think a little bit about that, but the cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. And of course, 1 divided by 0, well, that doesn't exist, or it's undefined. So we cannot give a value for the secant of 3 pi over 2. It just doesn't exist. All right, let's do one more of them. The cosecant of negative pi over 6 is going to be 1 divided by the sine of negative pi divided by 6. Right now, again, I'm going to assume that you've been with me for all these lessons and that you know that the sine of negative pi divided by 6 will be negative 1 half and 1 divided by negative 1 half is negative 2. All right. So first and foremost, what we have to be able to do with all the trig functions is evaluate them. And we're, you know, if, if we've got our calculator, then obviously we're going to use that to help us. But if we're work working with special values, then we have to go back and use our knowledge about those. All right. I'm going to scrub out the text here in a moment, so please take a look. If you need to, copy anything down, and then we're going to get rid of it. Here we go. All right, let's move on to the next page. Very mechanical lesson that we have today, kind of dry. Um, after we've been able to evaluate these four trig functions, we'd also like to be able to sketch general graphs. Now, we're not going to get into heavy graphing like we did with sine and cosine. We're not going to be looking at amplitudes and frequencies and periods, although these certainly are all periodic functions. But what we do want to be able to do is produce the graphs of cotangent, tangent, cosecant, and secant upon demand. So exercise three asks us to, to create a graph of y equals cosecant x on the interval negative 2 pi to 2 pi. And then it says draw all vertical asymptotes with a dashed line. All right. So in order to think about the cosecant function, no great surprise, we're going to think about it as 1 divided by the sine of x. Now, let, let, let's do a little sketch. Well, I suppose it could have been worse. Um, I want to do my standard. Maybe fill in that little blank there. Right, we've got our pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi. Now, although it's not absolutely mandatory, what a lot of students will do, and I'm going to change to a different color, is they'll actually draw this in dashed, right? So I'm going to do that just for a minute. I'm going to put in a little 1, a little negative 1. I'm going to do this very, very quickly and hopefully relatively accurately. Right. I'm going to actually draw it in, gra in dashed only because it's not actually the graph I want, right? That, that just completely missed. I'm not sure where I was going with that. It's kind of loud. <laughs> ah, mm, so nice. Anyway, so that's roughly the graph of y equals sine x. Now, keep in mind that we're going to get ourselves in trouble anywhere that sine x is equal to 0. And that's going to occur at pi, 2 pi, negative pi, and negative 2 pi. And whenever we have that happening, and 0, sorry, whenever we have that happening, we're going to get vertical asymptotes. Because we're going to be forced to divide by very, very small quantities giving us very large results as we get close to those values. I'm going to go back to blue now. 
all right? The only question is, as we approach those asymptotes, are we headed to infinity or are we headed towards negative infinity? So again, let, let, let's think about our ratio here, one divided by sine x. And let's just think about it first in this interval. Well, in this interval, sine x is always greater than zero. So one divided by sine x must be greater than zero. One more thing, at pi over two, just think about what cosecant would be. At pi over two, cosecant would be one divided by this y value, right? But that y value is one. So one divided by one is one. So we actually have a, a point right now on our cosecant graph. As we get closer and closer to pi, though, we're dividing by a smaller and smaller sine value, which is forcing our ratio to get larger and larger. The same thing happens as we approach x equals zero. We're dividing by a smaller and smaller sine value. We can do this in each one of the intervals. If we think about three pi over two, our sine is negative one. And as we get closer and closer to those asymptotes, we must go towards negative infinity because we're always dividing by a negative number. Same thing occurs here. and here. One of these days I will have practiced enough with graphing uh, on the tablet to have it really well, but that's all we have. Now, again, I did this rather quickly, but the key to remember is that you're dividing by the y-coordinate on the sign, right? So when the y-coordinate on the sign is 1, such as up here, well, 1 divided by 1 is 1. But as we decrease the sine value, we increase that ratio because we're dividing one by a smaller and smaller number. Same thing happens here, but because we're dividing one by a negative number, we tend to bend down to negative infinity. All right, classic graph of cosecant of x. I'm gonna scrub out this graph in a moment, so really take a look and think about it. All right, here it goes. All right, let's take a look at the next graph. Okay, so for homework, you're gonna be graphing y equals secant x and y equals cotangent x. But in the next exercise, we're gonna graph tangent of x. Now, this one's gonna be a little bit trickier for one primary reason, right? And the reason being that tangent x, y equals tangent of x, now has this interplay, right? You have to deal with both the sine function and the cosine function. So again, let me get a let me get an axis out here. All right, let's mark it with our typical special values. Pi over two, pi, three pi over two, two pi, same deal. negative pi over two, negative pi, negative three pi over two, and negative two pi. And now, um, let me go colors again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, don't, I don't have any idea whether this is gonna work well or not. I'm gonna dra graph sine in red. And let's graph cosine. I hope that shows up well. Let's graph cosine in green. That way you can really differentiate between the two and then we'll go graph tangent in, um, in blue again. So uh, real quick, I'm gonna graph my sine function and again, I'm gonna real quick, right? So my sine function in red, uh, just about as good of a graph as we had last time, which isn't saying much. I'm going to graph cosine in green. All right, eye on the ball, come on. There has got to be a way. I've seen many people do this much better than me. Again, not saying much. Okay, so we've got cosine in green, and we've got sine in red. Now, we have to think about what happens when we divide these. Again, let's go back and think um, about what our, where our vertical asymptotes are. They're gonna occur wherever cosine x is equal to zero. Well, that occurs here. So we'll have a vertical asymptote here. 
and here. And here. And here. Now I'm going to pick up a little bit more information too beside, before we go with the whole kind of sine divided by cosine look. The other thing I can actually do is I can figure out the x-intercepts of tangent. The x-intercepts. All right. So we, we know that the x-intercepts of tangent will be wherever sine x divided by cosine x is equal to zero. But as we know, as we've seen many times in this course, whenever we have a fraction equal to zero, we can just set the numerator equal to zero. So we can actually say that wherever sine has x-intercepts, wherever sine is zero, tangent is zero there as well, which is kind of nice. So I'm kind of drawing these like x-intercepts in nice and dark. All right, now let's talk asymptotes. As we approach those dashed lines, we are either going to be going up towards infinity or we're going to be headed down towards negative infinity. And the only question is, which way are we going? So let's just consider this particular interval. In this particular interval, to me, it is very obvious that the sine function is positive. And it's very obvious to me as well that the cosine function is also positive. So the net result must give me a tangent function that's positive and therefore must be headed to positive infinity. It's gotta be. Now let's consider this interval here. Again, no question in my mind that in this interval the sine function is negative. The cosine function is positive and therefore their ratio is negative. So it's got to bend down to negative infinity. So we get this fundamental curve for tangent. It looks a lot like x cubed. It does share some similarities like being an odd function but that's about where the similarities end. We could do this kind of analysis every single interval, but what we'd find is we'd find that fundamental waveform repeating itself. It's kind of a neat, neat waveform. I really like the way it looks. All right, here we only get half of it because we're sort of missing the portion down here and sort of same deal there. All right, so it's actually quite easy. As long as you understand the idea of an asymptote, a vertical asymptote that is, being a location where the denominator goes to zero and the numerator doesn't, then all you have to do is understand is, you know, sine and cosine, are they both positive? Are they both negative? Is one positive, one negative? And then that'll tell you which way the curve is bending. All right, so take a good look at that graph. It's very, very colorful. And uh, copy down anything you need to. All right, I'm going to scrub the text. Let's go on to the next page. All right, final exercise. So again, this is a very mechanical lesson. You know, we just sort of like are reviewing things. The next exercise is a little bit misplaced perhaps, but um, it's a skill that's kind of important to have. Exercise five says, given that theta, our angle, is between zero and pi over two, and sine theta is given by x divided by five, we want to find expressions in terms of x, very important, for cosine, tangent, secant, and cosecant. All right, there's actually a lot of different ways to do this, a lot of different ways. But the kind of classic way is sort of, sort of neat. What you do is you actually go back to a little right triangle trig. All right, so I'm going to create a right triangle, all right, and I'm going to throw in a little theta here. Now what do I know? I know that sine theta is x divided by 5. So I want to label this right triangle in a way that makes sure that sine theta is x divided by 5. Pause the video right now and think about how to do that. All right. Sine is opposite divided by hypotenuse. So although there are many, many ways that we can get a sine to be x divided by 5, the easiest way is to make the opposite side x and the hypotenuse 5. Of course, that leaves to question what that side is, but of course we can find that, think about this, with the Pythagorean theorem, right? Let me, uh, let me just erase this for a second, get rid of that, go back to my pen. 
if you need to, you could call that b, and you could just do a little, ah, b squared plus x squared is equal to five squared, which is 25. b squared is 25 minus x squared. So b will be the square root of 25 minus x squared. I really should put plus or minus in front of it, but because I know that my angle lies in the first quadrant, I know that everything is positive, and I'm just looking for a length anyway. Don't distribute that square root. It's not 5 minus x, right? It's the square root of 25 minus x squared. But the rest of this problem is quite easy. Pause the video now and see if you can come up with expressions for cosine theta, tangent theta, secant theta, and cosecant theta. All right, let's go through it. All we have to do is follow our definitions. Let's see. Well, from right triangle trig, we know that cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and therefore that will be the square root of 25 minus x squared divided by 5. There we go. Not pretty, but gets the job done. Tangent theta, well, we could certainly do sine divided by cosine, but wouldn't it be nice if we just remembered that it was opposite divided by adjacent? If we remembered that, then it would be easy enough to just say that the tangent will be x divided by square root of 25 minus x squared. Pretty simple. Let's see. Secant theta. Now, one thing I'd like you to know about secant and cosecant is that they're called the reciprocal functions. And they're called that for a reason, right? What they do is they flip or reciprocate the cosine and the sine function. So secant theta should take cosine and it should just flip it. In other words, secant will simply be 5 divided by 25 minus x squared under the square root. And cosecant theta, likewise, is just going to flip sine, and that is the nicest of them all. 5 divided by x. All right, that is important. It's a skill set that's going to come up um, quite a bit in sort of second semester calculus, um, especially when you're dealing with, strangely enough, the inverse trig functions. So pause the video if you need to, because I'm going to scrub out the text. All right, here it goes. All right, so that wasn't too bad of a lesson. Thank you again for joining me. I'm Kirk Weiler. This has been a lesson from Arlington High School on Math for Honors, unit number six, lesson number six, other trigonometric functions. As always, you can find a link to the uh, lesson that we just went through and a homework for the lesson by clicking on the video's description. All right, we'll be seeing you again soon, but until next time, Keep thinking and keep solving problems.